Thanks very much. Well, um, I'm just going to give a short introduction to the role of the arts with the Guild today and the, where, what's it, what it's rooted in, and then I'm going to introduce Sarah Woods. The Guild has been working with the arts as part of John Ruskin's mission to make lives better for people ever since Ruskin established St George's Museum in a cottage in Walkley, a working neighbourhood in Sheffield in 1875. The museum housed a remarkable collection of drawings, paintings, minerals, architectural casts and illuminated books to provide beautiful things for the workers of Sheffield to look at and study in their own neighbourhood. In the crowded front room, visitors could see paintings by John Walton Bunny, including the huge St Mark's Basilica that's in the exhibition here today. They could look at engravings by Turner, woodcuts by Durer, architectural casts of Venetian architecture, alongside drawings by Ruskin himself. A radical act indeed. When the collection outgrew its humble home in 1890, it was moved to Mearsbrook Hall in Mearsbrook Park, a leafier suburb in Sheffield. In 1985, it came into the city centre to the airy rooms of the Ruskin Gallery, and then it moved to the sleek new Millennium Gallery in 2001, sitting between the Winter Gardens and the Contemporary Craft Gallery. The Ruskin collection is redisplayed twice a year and visited by 60,000 people annually. So, for over 140 years, visitors have been able to enjoy the art of the Ruskin collection to see what Ruskin found beautiful in the built and natural world. I don't know if you can read all of these. All I was trying to do was, as I talked, was give you a smattering of what the Guild is doing in the arts now, and that's the Millennium Gallery up there and various projects in, Ruskin, in uh, Sheffield and the Wire Forest. Um, since 2009, a series of Ruskin exhibitions at the Millennium Gallery and now here at Two Temple Place has brought Ruskin to new audiences, exhibitions themed around environment, landscape and craftsmanship with items from the collection curated alongside new commissions from contemporary artists. Then, in 2014, the Guild initiated a programme called Ruskin in Sheffield to explore how it might revitalise the role of the collection as a source of education and inspiration for a modern audience. The Ruskin in Sheffield programme programme of events and activities has engaged over 15,000 adults and children with themes of the collection in neighbourhoods and with neighbourhoods, with heritage connections and some of the most deprived communities in the city. We've created a pop-up museum, a Ruskin's Use and Beauty Parlour in a shopping precinct, outdoor performances, big draw festivals across entire parks and neighbourhoods. And this year, for the first time, a three-week future fantastic utopian festival. Um, at the same time, Ruskin Land in the Wire Forest has been developing arts programmes there, including traditional and contemporary craft workshops, nature drawing events, and hosted the experimental Studio in the Woods architecture programme. So with this recent diversification in how the Guild works with the arts, today's talk from Sarah Woods provides a useful moment of reflection to help consider how the Guild might embrace the arts in the future in its mission to make lives better. I'm not sure where, is Sarah at the back? That's fine. I've got a little bit to say about you first. But it is with great pleasure that I introduce Sarah Woods, a playwright and campaigner for better lives, who works with story through many different activities and for many different audiences. Her theatre work's been produced by the RSC, the Hampstead, Soho Theatre and the BBC, and she's written extensively for Radio 4. Her recent dramatisation of Karl Marx's Das Kapital was commended at the BBC Audio Drama Awards, and her original drama Borderland, imagining a possible post-Brexit UK, won the 2018 Tinniswood Award for the best radio script of the year. Her show, written and performed with Andrew Sims, Neoliberalism, The Breakup Tour, is currently touring around the UK. Sarah's led outreach projects including the cooperative groups Anti-Tar Sands and Frack Free UK campaigns and the Fabian Society's Food and Poverty Commission. She's currently working with Global Action Plan on their Beyond Consumerism project, working with secondary school students to explore the effects of advertising and social media. Sarah's university work includes the design of a module called Transforming Food Systems for Lancaster University and a, a newly designed specialism, The Topography of Story, looking at how story affects all aspects of our lives for the Danish National School of Performing Arts. And if that, as if that is not enough, Sarah is currently writing an opera for Welsh National Opera and a musical for Cardboard Citizens, a theatre company which works with people affected by homelessness and is also working on a new production with the Oasis Refugee Centre in Cardiff. So with that, I introduce Sarah Woods.
Thank you. Oh, I feel quite tired now. I've heard it read out as a list. <laughs> um, so I'm really delighted to be here. I'm really chuffed to have been invited. It's a really lovely opportunity. And it's given me um, the chance to pull together a lot of thoughts that have been orbiting around my brain for a little while. So thank you for that. Um, the first thing that I want to do is to reverse back from the title that I was given um, for this lecture or that I found written on the, on the piece of paper, a vision for the continued relevance of the arts to the Guild of St. George. And I want to go back quite some distance to think about what we mean by the arts. In the nature of Gothic, Ruskin likens the difficulty of defining Gothicness to someone trying to explain the nature of redness without any actual red thing to point to, but only orange and purple things. Suppose he had only a piece of heather and a dead oak leaf to do it with. He might say, the colour which is mixed with the yellow in this oak leaf and with the blue in this heather would be red if you had it separate. The character of Gothic is, he says, made up of many mingled ideas and can consist only in their union. That is to say, pointed arches do not constitute Gothic, nor vaulted roofs, nor flying buttresses, nor grotesque sculptures, but all, or some of these things and many others with them, when they come together so as to have life. And art is like that. We all have some definite notion, Ruskin continues. Most of us are very determined one of the meaning of the term Gothic. But I know that many persons have this idea in their minds without being able to define it. And when I say the arts, I imagine that if I was to able to open a little door and look into each of your heads, I'd see some very determined notions, probably some paintings, probably some of them hanging on a wall, probably a play being performed on a stage or an orchestra. But what else? What else is in your heads? Dancing, sculpting, a ceramic pot? And what about the stuff that sits at the edges of what is more traditionally called the arts? Perhaps the stuff in some of your heads that makes you think, well, is that art or is that something else? The more that we focus on the idea of art, the more that we try and think about what it is, the more the artness of art begins to slip and slide and mingle with connected ideas and processes. And to help us understand gothicness, Ruskin comes up with a list of six moral elements, the majority of which must be present in order for the building to have a gothic character. So following his lead, there are three elements that I'd like to propose as useful to us in defining the artness of the arts before we explore a vision for them. There are others, but I think I'll stick to three in order that you're not still here tomorrow morning. Ruskin believes that products are the result of healthy and ennobling labour, as recognised by the observance of three broad and simple rules, another one of his threes. The first being, never encourage the manufacture of any article not absolutely necessary in the production of which invention has no share. Continuing, the cutting of precious stones requires little exertion of any mental faculty, some tact and judgment in avoiding flaws, but nothing to bring out the whole mind. Every person who wears cut jewels merely for the sake of their value is therefore a slave driver. It sounds stern, but I agree. I've been writing plays since I was quite a young child, which evolved out of and was part of observing people in the world and also then playing with dolls. And that's essentially the job of a playwright. It's to look at the world carefully and then create versions of it using pretend people or actors and um, pretend lives. Creativity is a process by which a number of distinct ideas or elements are connected into a whole. And it's a process also which, as Ruskin points out, brings out the whole mind. Now, the simplest and most graspable description of creativity that I've come across 
is in a short book called A Technique for Getting Ideas by James Woods Young, which you can only really get, I think, on the internet now. And he says it's the emergence of new combinations, a process depending largely on an ability to see relationships. And already you can see from some of the brilliant stuff we've heard today, these same themes re-emerging. So he suggests the production of ideas unconsciously or consciously follows a five-step method. The first is the gathering of raw material, which is such a terrible chore, he says, that we're constantly trying to dodge it, which is worth remembering. The materials are of two kinds, specific in relation to the problem at hand and general, which again I think is important. The second part is masticating, he uses some very unattractive language, but we'll go with it, masticating these materials as you would food that you're preparing for digestion, which he describes as taking the different bits of material which you've gathered and feeling them, as it were, with the tentacles of the mind, which I'm going to try when I get home tonight. And then, after a while, you'll reach the hopeless stage. He says, when you reach this point... If you first really persisted in efforts to fit your puzzle together, then the second stage in the whole process is completed. Thirdly comes the incubating stage, where you let something beside the conscious mind do the work of synthesis. Drop the problem completely, he says, and return to whatever stimulates your emotions. Listen to music, go to the theatre or movies, read poetry. I often go and walk my dogs, so you pick whatever suits you, have a bath. The fourth step is the actual birth of the idea, which he says comes after you've stopped straining for them and have passed through a period of rest and relaxation from the search, which we'll all deserve by the end of today. The fifth step is the shaping and development of the idea to practical usefulness. Now, Ruskin refers to this process in the nature of Gothic, saying, you must either make a tool of the creature or a man of him, a very famous quote. You cannot make both. He says, men were not intended to work with the accuracy of tools. If you'll have that precision out of them and make their fingers measure degrees like cogwheels and their arms strike curves like compasses, you must unhumanise them. On the other hand, if you'll make a man of the working creature, you cannot make a tool. Let him but begin to imagine, to think, to try to do anything worth doing, and the engine turned precision is lost at once. Out come all his roughness, all his dullness, all his incapability, shame upon shame, failure upon failure, pause after pause but out comes the whole majesty of him also. And we know the height of it only when we see the clouds settling upon him. And whether the clouds be bright or dark, there will be transfiguration behind and within them. In a lecture at uh, London's Congress Centre, Tim Berners-Lee, the man credited with inventing the World Wide Web, talked about his vision of it as a place for the twin magics of collaboration and creativity, rather than the series of platforms for consumption that it has largely become. Ultimately, he reminds us, advances are most regularly achieved through the connection of people's half-formed half ideas, whether they're scientific, political, or cultural. Creativity, or invention, as Ruskin calls it, is to my mind number one on our list of the three elements which must be present in order for something to be called art. Ruskin's third rule, and we're going to come back to the second one, is never encourage imitation or copying of any kind, except for the sake of pre preserving a great work. William Morris was a great fan of Ruskin's The Nature of Gothic, calling it, in the preface he wrote for his Kelmscott edition of it, one of the very few necessary and inevitable utterances of the century. In his lecture, Some Hints on Pattern Designing, Morris says that at times when art has been unhealthy, beauty has given place to whim, imagination to extravagance, nature to sick nightmare fancies, and, fi and finally workmanlike considerate skill has given place to commercial trickery sustained by laborious botching. I'm sure we've all got some of that in our homes. 
He says, I want you to think of this when you see, as unfortunately you're only too likely often to see, some lifeless imitation of a piece of bygone art and are puzzled to know why it does not satisfy you. The reason is that the imitator has not entered into the soul of the dead artist, nay, has supposed that he had but a hand and no soul, and has so not known what he meant to do. In The Elements of Drawing, which if you haven't read it, I really recommend, and Ruskin wrote it through the winter of 1856, he says, the art of any country is the exponent of its social and political virtues. The art or general productive and formative energy of any country is an exact exponent of its ethical life. Donella Meadows, I don't know if you've come across her, is a great systems theorist. In her book, Thinking in Systems, tells us a system is an interconnecting set of elements that's coherently organized in a way that achieves something. A system must consist of three kinds of things, elements, interconnections, and a functional purpose. Art is like this. Formed of an interconnecting set of elements, it has a functional purpose, whether that's to entertain, to educate, to shock, to inspire. Like a system, a piece of art happens all at once. And it's connected not just in one direction, but in many directions. And that same pattern we see in the emergence of creativity, in the making of art, is there in the expression of that creativity, in the form of art itself. In Plato's theory of forms, he says, there's a form for every object and quality, for dogs, human beings, mountains, colors, courage, goodness, and love. And the form is the essence of the thing. The thing without which the thing is not the thing. Forms are pure. They're not physical, and they're not in the mind. They're extra mental. They transcend time, and they don't even have a location. That's how pure they are. Forms are perfect. The form of the dog, dogness, is perfect. The form of love, loveness, is perfect. The form of the chair, chairness, is perfect. No chair we can ever make is the form of chair. Our chairs are all imitations of chairness, shadows, momentary portrayals. Plato says that form answers the question, what is that? Which is a good question. In The Elements of Drawing, Ruskin advises the student of art to resolve always, as you look at the thing, what you will take and what miss of it. Only remember this, that there is no general way of doing anything. So a stone may be round or angular, polished or rough, cracked all over like an ill-glazed teacup, or as united and broad as the breast of Hercules. It may be as flaky as a wafer. He does overwrite sometimes, but I quite like this. Um, or as powdery as a, a field puffball. It may be knotted like a ship's hawser, or kneaded like hammered iron, or knit like a Damascus sabre, or fused like a glass bottle, or crystallized like hoarfrost, or veined like a forest leaf, Look at it, and don't try to remember how anybody told you to do a stone. The poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, who studied and wrote about Ruskin when he was a student at Oxford, wrote in his journal that what you look hard at seems to look hard at you. And he developed the term inscape, which is the thing that makes a thing itself and not something else. It's essential character. And he described it as held together by an energy he called in-stress. And he also created the verb to selve, to express the object's continual act of being itself, which he touches on in his poem as Kingfisher's Catch Fire. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same deals out that being indoors, each one dwells. Selves, goes itself, myself, it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, 
for that I came. Art, whether in the making or the experiencing of it, helps us to see things clearly. Often things that we're failing to notice. It helps us connect with things. Often things that are right in front of our eyes. In 2002, when he was United States Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, in response to a question about the lack of evidence linking the then Iraqi government with the supply of weapons of mass destruction to terrorist groups, said, as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And I'd argue that there's another class of things. Unknown knowns. Things we know, but don't always consciously know that we know. It's not the same thing as having forgotten. It's stuff we know in our bones. It borders on doublethink sometimes when the knowing starts to surface. Like knowing that having more money or buying more stuff doesn't make us happy. While feeling compelled to it. We can know and not know at the same time. In his lecture, The Relation of Art to Morals, delivered at Oxford University in 1870, Ruskin tells us that art can perfect the ethical state of human beings. Perfect, he reminds us, not produce. He takes the example of a skylark, saying that from him you may learn what it is to sing for joy. You must get the moral state first, the pure gladness, then give it finished experience. He continues, you can in truth understand a man's word only by understanding his temper. Your own word is also of an unknown tongue to him unless he understands yours. And, this is which makes, and it is this which makes the art of language. The secret of language is the secret of symphony, sympathy and its full charm is only possible to the gentle. Firstly, Art connects us to what it is to be human. Secondly, it connects us to another human being, the artist, or the person or experience the artist wants to communicate. We feel with the work. That process of empathy is a powerful one, enabling the complex journey from self to other, shifting us from our personal and entrenched point of view into that of another or others. Finally, it connects us to the wider world in its plurality and its complexity. And in my work, I often think of empathy as being like a gateway, an experience of feeling with that shifts us into a bigger-than-self state. So connection is the second element that I think is important to us, the systemic connection between us and another, us and nature, us and our values, us and complex issues that are bigger than ourselves. So we'll go back to Ruskin's second and, for us, final rule, which is never demand an exact finish for its own sake, but only for some practical or noble end. Again, from the nature of Gothic, he says, great art, whether expressing itself in words, colours or stones, does not say the same thing over and over again. The merit of architectural, as of every other art, consists in its saying new and different things. The idea of art not doing the same thing over and over sounds quite obvious. But in an age of mass production, it's often overlooked. And it's not simply about us not buying manufactured products marketed to us as art. Its manifestations are often much more subtle than that. In a society where success is measured most often in quantity and scale, of venues, of, of sales of bums on seats, of tickets, of newspaper reviews, uh, then as producers and funders and audiences and even as artists, we can slip into artwork that is more likely to meet that measurement. And we can do it even without realising we're doing it because that pattern is so entrenched in our lives, it can feel somehow right. That's not to say that everything that's large-scale or financially successful is by its very nature a piece of mass manufacture in a greater or lesser way. Of course, that's not true. But we should always ensure that we're holding good to Ruskin's maxim of saying new and different things. So the final element, which I think must be present in order for something to be art, is change. 
one way or another. I don't mean that art must always be about change, although a lot of it is, or that all art must seek to create change, although quite a lot of it does. I mean that art has a relationship to change in its making, in its transformation of materials, in the way that it acts on us as makers and as spectators. We live in complex times. We're wrestling with rising inequality, increasing um, expressions of fear and hatred towards those who are different to us, a broken economic system, and the growing effects of climate change, systemic problems for which there is not one single Liverpool solution. And as these systemic problems gather pace, so we're becoming more disconnected from the systems of our lives, from our food, our energy, from each other, and from the natural world. Speaking again of the division of labour in the nature of Gothic, Ruskin goes further. It is not, truly speaking, the labour that is divided, but the men. Divided into mere segments of men, broken into small fragments and crumbs of life, so that all the little piece of intelligence that is left in a man is not enough to make a pin or a nail, but exhausts itself in making the point of a pin or the head of a nail. Now it's a good and desirable thing truly to make many pins in a day, but if we could only see with what crystal sand their points were polished, sands of human soul, much to be magnified before it can be discerned for what it is, we should think there might be some loss in it also. Ruskin wasn't the only one of his contemporaries who was worried about the effects of the division of labour on the worker. Morris and Marx and even Adam Smith, who we have on our £20 note, along with um, his pin factory and the quote, the division of labour and the great increase in the quantity of work that results. And we, OK, we carry them around less, but we do carry them around with us, these little mottos. And he did say that the division of labour increases output. But he also said that the division and specialisation of work has consequences for the worker, who becomes as stupid and as ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become, rendering them incapable of rational conversation or of conceiving any generous, noble or tender sentiment and consequently of forming any just judgment. Ruskin and Marx and Morris and Smith see the effects of the division of labour clearly, partly because they're just at the beginning of it. It's just starting. And we're at the other end of it. And we're perhaps failing to see clearly how this pattern of division introduced through the Industrial Revolution is now in us not only as workers, but as artists and as citizens or customers and consumers and clients, as we're more often known. The next village to where I live um, is Chorleywood in Hertfordshire, which is best known for the Chorleywood bread process, which was invented in 1961. Until then, bread rose over many hours, but the Chorleywood process with its high energy mixers and chemicals could make a white loaf much quicker. But if you don't ferment the dough for very long, you don't activate the naturally occurring bacteria that makes the bread more digestible, more tasty, more nutritious. So to make up for the nutrition lost to our baking and milling methods, the bread is fortified with B vitamins and calcium and iron, iron that isn't even available to our human digestive system. And we use this method for 80% of our bread, sliced and unsliced, loaves and rolls. It's like there's breadness, Plato's ideal that we can never see and yet we know. And then there are best attempts at breadness. And then there's this absence of breadness. <laughs> the thing without the thing that makes the thing the thing. It's got no inscape, as Hopkins would say. And when we ask ourselves, what is that? It's really hard to know. Having worked diligently at our platonic shadows and imitations for a long time, we seem to have forgotten the importance of looking at things hard. And so we are denied their hard look back. 
as Ruth said, I'm working on a number of different projects, even at the moment. Um, a libretto for Welsh National Opera, a musical about DIY culture for Cardboard Citizens, a podcast for the BBC, along with various campaigning things. Um, and it does seem, it sounds fairly disparate, but it does use that same set of skills of working creatively with story in a connected way, sometimes with research, with experts, sometimes with communities, with values, and always, one way or another, in relation to change. For me, the form of the work, of any artwork, depends on what's required of the content, the job that it seeks to do. Sometimes an opera might be the most useful art form, sometimes a campaign, sometimes a new piece written with 23 recently arrived refugees. About six years ago, I was asked to be part of a meeting at the National Theatre exploring um, the arts response to climate change. And we talked about opera and theatre and dance. And eventually, I plucked up the courage to say, well, could we talk about community theatre? And I was met with absolute blank stares, silence and bemusement. Yet community theatre to give it one name, has been an important part of our civic life in this country for centuries, with mystery plays, mummers' plays, folk traditions like the Mary Lloyd in Wales and wassailing, connecting us to the seasons, to nature, to our values, and to birth and death. And while artisan is these days more likely to be a place where you can buy a coffee for £5.50, the term artisan refers to a craftsman who engages in the entire production process, of a good, containing almost no division of labour. And we are beginning to see, and we've talked about it a little bit today, a, a resurgence in craft. My 21-year-old daughter has recently taken, taken up crocheting. And we're seeing a rebirthing of what we might call community art, or art that is made outside of traditional art spaces. More recently, new forms of community art have developed. And I think that's largely in response to an art-shaped whole around some of the biggest challenges that we currently face, with artists feeling that it's our responsibility to inhabit that space in ways that are useful, that encourage agency and enable shift and change. Necessarily, much of this kind of work starts close to the people, the communities who need it. It's emergent, it's often edgy, often difficult to categorise. And this sense of civic responsibility and response is being felt by a wide range of creative practitioners. Dancers, furniture designers, playwrights, community activists are all speaking this same language, creating new artistic practices and methods of public engagement that do the jobs that art needs to do now and for the future. What a lot of this sort of art has in common in, is that it's as much about process, in fact, often more about process than product, sometimes involving amateur performers and uh, local makers. Linking this sort of art to fine art, seeing them as different tools for the same job, is, I think, a really important part of our journey into the future as audiences as well as artists. Research from the Oxford Martin School at the University of Oxford shows that in the UK, 56% of jobs in transportation and storage are at high risk of automation. 25% of professional, scientific and technical jobs. And 22% of jobs in the arts and entertainment. And that in the future, employment in the retail industry is likely to vanish altogether. So this affects every city, every region. And overall, 30% or 10.4 million UK jobs, they say, are at high risk of automation. The jobs that are least susceptible to computerisation include those in the fine arts that require originality, negotiation, persuasion, social perceptiveness, and creative intelligence. Those are some of their categories. I teach playwriting at Manchester University, where a good number of my students struggle with feelings of guilt and distress at having disappointed their parents by taking a degree in drama and not one with a more obvious and profitable vocational trajectory. Yet the Oxford Martin School's research clearly tells us that the skills developed through an arts education are not only key to us as a society as we move forward, but key to successful, and if we listen to Ruskin, satisfying employment. 
Surely, then, the arts are an important part of the education of our young people. Writing of hope, one of his six essentials for right living, Ruskin accuses his fellow humans of not having the intelligence of it in you, as to be able to form one clear idea of what you would like our country to become. <laughs> Sounds familiar. My children, who are between the ages of 18 and 23, have grown up on a diet of dystopias, narratives of collapse. The writer and activist Paul Mason suggests this is because we're rehearsing the end of capitalism. We're certainly rehearsing the end of something, and Michael Roberts, who's here, who's written a book looking um, at different, different utopianists, has uh, something more to say on this, I'm sure. They've also been, um, they've been seen, uh, so utopian and utopian thinking have often been seen as flaccid and escapist. And they've also been seen as dangerous, as if like Harry Potter when he's gazing into the mirror of Erised, we will be driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. But what if identifying and expressing our hopes and desires for a positive future is both a useful and a necessary thing? Ruth Levitas suggests that we see utopia as a method rather than a goal, a method that uses our imagination to address the challenges we face. So it's not about creating a blueprint, because as we know, change breeds change. Everything, including ourselves, are changed by change. So a blueprint is outmoded as soon as it's made. Instead of creating a place to be arrived at, utopian thinking can help us explore and develop ideas and the connections between ideas, a sort of prefigurative practice, a trying out, something that plays have been doing since before the Greeks. This sort of utopianism works towards a broadening, a deepening, and raising of expectations that Miguel, Miguel Abenso, writing about Morris's News from Nowhere, calls the education of our desires. He says this is not the same as a moral education towards a given end. It's rather to open a way to aspiration, to teach desire, to desire better, to desire more, and above all, to desire in a different way. Art is a hugely important part of the process of imagining the future and getting there. Paintings and plays and symphonies and creative campaigns and co-created story spaces and pop-up community art ven venues and even art forms that we haven't thought of yet. Imagining the future of art must surely be a creative process in and of itself, one that focuses on the emergence of new combinations through looking clearly at relationships. We've discovered that any vision or utopia is a set of ideas, not a blueprint, because change, change breeds change. And I'd propose that the set of ideas, that that set of ideas has the three elements of creativity, connection, and a relationship to change as its tiller, reminding us that where everywhere is the same, there is no art. Where there is imitation and no invention, there is no art. And where there is only division and no wholeness, there can be no art. It feels right to give Ruskin the final word from his lectures on art, um, again delivered in Oxford in 1870. He says, on the walls and towers of this your fair city, there is not an ornament of which the first origin may not be traced back to the thoughts of men who died 2,000 years ago. Whom will you be governing by your thoughts 2,000 years hence? Goodness me. Sarah, <laughs> thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, so I'm sure there will be questions uh, just bubbling up from there. We've got about uh, just maybe five, ten minutes for questions, and then we'll move on to our panel session just to bring it all together. Uh, but just straight away, are there any things that you want to say? Yes, the gentleman at the back there. Hi, um, Patrick Curry. Um, I think you skirted it, my question. I want to try and put my finger on a point to a possible problem or 
or even trap. But I think you, you skirted it just before you finished by saying uh, we're not interested in blueprints, mm. but processes. But what I was going to say was, is there not a potential problem with, insofar as art can only have its fullest effects, including its fullest positive social effects, when it is not intended to have effects? In other words, to take agitprop as an extreme example, mm. it's usually very bad art and doesn't even succeed mm. in having the effects that it sets out to have, whereas art that, that does succeed in that way is not always directly intended to, to have that effect. Do you see mm -hmm. what I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah. Could yeah. you just say something about that? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, and I think the, the I suppose the, if you look at what I was saying about the sort of real basis of creativity, which is that it's about connection and relationship, agitprop doesn't really have that, you know, or, or any of that stuff that just says, you know, think, think this, believe this. It, you know, it would, it would fail. I think it would ta fail the test in the, it, in the it, way I've set it out. It I think it, it would knows. just fail. So, yeah, I think, I think that's what I'm arguing for, is for us to, to use that sort of discernment in the same way that Ruskin says, let's really look at this stone and not just do a stone. Let's not just do art. Let's really look at what is this, you know, and, and, and look at its form. So, absolutely, I agree with you, and I think Agitprop would sadly fail the test. I wanted to ask, and I'm not sure who should pick this up really, but there is this thing about becoming more human or more whole, uh, which I think Ruskin seemed to be very keen on. And whether it was in work or whether it was art uh, or whether it was the environment, he seemed to be look, expecting whatever we did to make us somehow better people uh, and broader in our, in our thinking, broader in our uh, ways of acting. And I wondered whether there was a theme here in terms of education uh, because, of course, there's a new generation, aren't there, of mm. people who've never heard anything about art, never heard anything about environment, necessarily uh, never heard anything about Ruskin, why should they? Um, so I just wondered whether there's an issue for education that uh, needs to be addressed to help us be those broader and better people. Put that one up for you. Shall I say something? Go ahead. Would you? Would you? Yeah, shall I? I'll start then. Um, I think... When we talk about education, it's, it's the same, again, as Ruskin would say about a stone. I think we've got to look at the young people we've got in front of us, and I think we'd be hugely surprised. Sometimes they're very predictable, but in other ways, I think they're enormously surprising, and I think their uh, experience of the world is very different to ours. And I uh, look at my, um, my young people and all the young people I'm connected with and who I teach, and I think, there's, I think they, they know all this stuff, and they almost know it more sharply than we do, because um, it's a little bit like when you look at, um, at Seoul and South Korea and you look at how quickly, you know, in a 30-year period, there's been such a huge amount of change that in some ways they see more clearly the effects of, of you know, sort of rampant capitalism. And, uh, and I think when you look at young people, th this is absolutely prescient for them. So I'd just urge that, you know, educationally, that we work from, from those young people, which is what I try to do, and I think it's, that's hugely rewarding. So one of the... I, I had a thought on this. One of the most exciting communications I've had about my book came from a headmaster in a school in Liverpool who contacted me out of the blue, having read the book, I try and cover everything that Ruskin, uh, Ruskin does. So the result is it's sort of probably an inch thick and, and several miles wide. But he had been particularly struck by what Ruskin said about education mm. and uh, the very broad curriculum that Ruskin proposed for his St George's schools uh, and wanted to recast the curriculum of his school. It's not a state school. I think it's state, partially state-funded, but obviously has some leeway on curriculum and wanted to know who to contact that I might have spoken to to talk about this breadth of curriculum. And I, I thought that was quite moving, really, that there is still some way in which the Ruskinian ideal of this very broad-based education could still be active today. And I do think, and, and actually we each of us touched on it a little bit, the specialisation point um, we do drive our young people, I've got children of similar age to yours, 
down a very narrow path very quickly and we insist on them, uh, as you were saying, doing the thing that is going to be vocationally correct for them according to this tiny snapshot that they have at the moment of a, of a jobs market, mm -hmm. when in fact mm -hmm. they're going to live probably longer than we do and have a wider range of things that they can or should do over that career. So I think there are some real, really interesting ways in which the Ruskin, Ruskin's conception of a broad-based education could yeah. be valuable for mm -hmm. our young people. Absolutely. Um, I've just been thinking personally. I. One of the great moments in my life was discovering that having been made to choose between arts and science at grammar school and then going on into uh, tertiary education, discovering this thing called landscape architecture, which allowed me to actually do both. Um, as somebody who'd never been very good at any of those things, but could do most of them. Um, and I, I'm very struck, whenever I'm in these kinds of conversations, with the greatest respect, the focus always comes down to young people. You know, they are the future, all that stuff, and I've been involved with environmental education long enough to, to believe all of that, although you know, certainly in my field there is something terrible that happens to what were bright-eyed eight-year-olds when they get to 14, and you just hope at some point it <laughs> returns in their consciousness. But I'm really interested in the third age, uh, because what we now have is my generation, who have been through that funnel, have had careers for most of us, and I'm delighted to say not me, but actually for many of the people I deal with, of being stifled and constrained and narrowed down. And yet they may have another 30 years to go when they come out of the end of that tunnel. And I just don't think we've even begun, really, to think about how we, how we really foster that opportunity. And there was an element of it in your presentation and the conversation that followed about um, liberating people to engage either within work or, or right. as volunteers or in the broader landscape. But I, I just think we, we really are missing a trick, actually, because what you've then got is a combination of a lifetime of accumulated wisdom, one would hope, real power and influence in many of them, and actually if they're alerted to it, a realisation of how stifling that lifestyle has been. And, uh, and yet, there's still time to do something about it. And it's no coincidence, I don't think, that the people who turn up volunteering um, in the wire, for instance, many of them have come out at the end of that tunnel and thought, God, what was that all about? Mm. This is what I really want to be doing. Mm. And, and we've still not really addressed the idea that you could have a new and broader career, for argument's sake, starting at 50. And I think that's partly because we are so preoccupied with our failure of young people um, that we never get round to talking about the rest of society. So, you know, as one of those people in that third age, I just feel we need a few more champions of my generation who've suffered that constraining half century and deserve better, really. Yeah, plenty of food for thought there. Any observations or comments? Peter. Peter Day. Um, I think all three speakers have touched on something extraordinarily important because of the possibilities it opens up for the relevance of Ruskin in the 21st century. Uh, and it may be even bigger than they have laid out. Uh, Andrew talking about... Uh, implicitly rather than explicitly the busted flush of uh, financial capitalism and the fact that we're still living in a, uh, the aftermath of crisis, financial crisis, and that's a big problem. And then Ruth touching on the Martin Institute's findings on the rise of the robot and the implications for employment, which are quite enormous, enormous to the extent that people in Silicon Valley Capitalists are seriously talking about the need for a basic income to keep consumers spending so that the robots are turning out <laughs> things that can be sold by the capitalist companies. Otherwise, the whole thing falls apart. And then the third age. Uh, another great problem because of demographic trends 
making the world, or at least the developing world, for the moment, a very much older place, which in health and uh, social service terms, places like Britain, places like America, places like Europe, will not be able to cope with financially as service providers, national health, etc. Enormous opportunities present themselves for Ruskinite ideas, for the rise of craft as an, as a, an employment or a, a doing thing, um, the rise of new kinds of, yes, of uh, adjusted capitalism perhaps, and the huge rise, uh, as big as the response of the rise of the woman's voluntary service in 1938, by 1941, more than two million women had volunteered for the women's voluntary service because of the war effort. And we are facing a change, a jolt to the system, which is as enormous as going to war. And Ruskinian ideas are at the heart of really powerful responses to these disruptions of the settled system we've had for a hundred years. And that's an enormously stimulating prospect for the Guild of St. George, and a lot of people connected and inspired by Ruskinian ideas, I think. And I speak as a rather a newcomer to Ruskin, if not to the other things in the system. Um, that's been fantastic. I've got a couple of ideas I really want you to test and see if they're any good. Um, first, I think, and this is me as a director of the Guild, not saying it to the whole board, but we can all sort of chew this over later. I think we ought to commission S Sarah to write uh, a play. Because <laughs> <laughs> you haven't got enough on, as far as I can tell. No, 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 there's no rush. Uh, 2021 would be the date, because it's the 150th anniversary of the Guild that could tour the country and sort of let Ruskin out a bit. So he's not held in these sort of places like this. It sort of builds on what Ruth's been doing in Sheffield. But I think when a lot of people hear it, they say, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got to get it out there. So it's got to be something that can go around the village halls and the, 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 the school assembly rooms and all the rest of it. So that's one idea. The other one, I think, uh, I was listening to another chap that um, Chris and I know very well, Brett Westwood, who you might hear on the radio doing Tweet of the Day. And he was talking about a very small patch of land that a village had taken on and had recreated. You know, they'd sown lots of wildflower seeds. And the whole village was now uh, looking, and that's my point, looking at that patch. And I thought, what about an idea about each year we give a community a grant to create a Ruskin patch? And it not only brings wildlife back to them, but they then are encouraged to write about it, to paint it, to you know, hold a play on it, for goodness sake. So I really want you to sort of think if there's a germ of an idea, any of those, that would work and critique it and see where we get to. Um, yeah, I, I mean, a lot of my early career was spent dealing with very unpromising communities in very unpromising places, um, and particularly working with kids. And in the late 70s and early 80s, I was working in... The, the, there was a period when almost everywhere I was working, there were riots. And I was, you know... <laughs> some people were not quite sure about the cause and effect relationship. But, I, for instance, I worked in Toxteth and Hackney and Brixton and Deptford and grim parts of the inner city. Um, and one of my great moments was at the end of the Brixton riots, when everything in Brixton had been trashed and nobody had touched the sunflowers on the Tulse Hill Nature Garden because the kids had planted the sunflowers and grown them. Um, and that, that changed my life, actually, that experience. I was working, I had a parallel career working in the Middle East in uh, designing and planting forests in the desert, which was about as inane a kind of thing as you could imagine, really, by contrast. And then the Thatcher government came in um, and we had a choice as a practice. Do we all go out to the Middle East or do we close the practice down? We closed the practice down. Everybody else went to the Middle East. And I was adopted by the Thatcher government to work with something called the Priority Estates Project. And the reason that what I was doing appealed, I think, was because, first of all, it, it cost nothing. 
and it was empowering people to take responsibility for where they lived. Um, and what was really striking about it for me was that actually it could work absolutely anywhere. And the smaller the piece of land, in a way, the better. And I, I used to, working with kids, one of the things we used to do was go on safari along a, a, a piece of string, a yard of string, or a metre if you, you know, um, run along the ground, and then on hands and knees with a magnifying glass to go on safari through the long grass. And I remember talking about this to a group of councillors in, in Essex in the mid-80s and, uh, and about how powerful this could be. And there was a, a head of, uh, a chairman of planning was there who was kind of represented the other side of the coin, really, and was, you know, determined to bulldoze their way through Essex and build on everything. And he came up afterwards with tears in his eyes and he said... God, he said, I've been thinking all the time you were talking about the big wood. And he said, I know where the big wood is, and it's three trees. But for all of my childhood, it was this magical place that seemed endless and was full of opportunities. And it's the kind of place that we don't give a second thought to. And we bulldoze out of the way. And, and so I think there is a real uh, element in what you're saying of just homing down and giving people uh, the encouragement, not just to look, but to actually influence as well. And I, I suppose one of the salutary lessons in all of that is that, uh, for the most part, it's never a good idea to go back. Um, and most of those experiences are transitory. And there's one group of kids who were in, happened to be in Brixton when I was there in the early 80s for whom that two or three years was, was one would like to think very significant. In that particular instance, I did go back 40 years later and the Tulsil Nature Garden was still there and had been through various iterations. But um, I think the moment, you know, one year in the life of a child is, you know, 10% of their learning process as a child, if you like. And so you can achieve a huge amount with very few resources. Uh, and it's about giving a license to look differently at things, really. Yeah, I think, that's a, I think it's a very strong idea. Also because, you know, you'd have to be... Um, you'd have to... You would be concentrating people on one aspect of Ruskin's thinking rather than what's your phrase, um, Ruth? Getting trying to grab the whole knotty mess uh, and you know, get the, get your hands around the whole of Ruskin is very difficult. But just having some little piece that makes people think, um, I'm looking closely. I'm thinking about the environmental part of this and potentially, as you say, inspiring inspiring some small group of people, a bit like Ruskin did with his network of road builders that he inspired in Oxford, many of whom went on to do great things. Just having that in various parts of the country would be an interesting way of seeding, literally, some new ideas and new thinking. There's um, an arts organisation Ruth and I have worked with um, called Encounters, who's done a project called A Little Patch of Ground which is not dissimilar, although what they do is they'll I identify a community and a, a space, and then they'll make, so sometimes it's on the verge of somewhere, but they'll then, uh, it's like a nine-month project, is it, something like that, where they, um, in the, they'll, they'll grow, but as they're grow, you know, sowing and growing, they're also doing art and, and learning. So it might be nice to sort of have a, a, a pack that goes with it, that enables people to think about it in a sort of multidisciplinary way. And then at the end, they have some sort of a showing and a meal, which is nice. I think, I think it's quite important that, that um, you find a way of teasing out the examples of what you're talking about that already exists yeah. as well. I mean, I, the, the river wall that I was talking about towards the end of my presentation, if you, if you know the Thames, you'll probably know, you may know Deptford Creek. It's not a very fashionable bit of the Thames. It is actually where Queen Elizabeth I went to knight Sir Walter Raleigh, so it does have a bit of history about it. But there's an environmental education centre there, and at low tide, local kids are taken down to walk through the mud. And if you're lucky, there will be somebody leading them that will 
stand them in front of a stretch of that river wall and if they look close enough they'll see the fish the fish fry in there amongst the vegetation and then the tide comes back in again and they continue their journey so there are wonderful examples of people working in this kind of way Ruth been um, working in Sheffield and how you have been in the wire there's always something attractive I think about oh we've got a good idea so we put it here here and here and actually what where Ruskin was really strong and I think where the guild is successful is when it works in place mm. and it spreads out from that place because I think you're right I think there's certain organizations that can go oh we're going mm -hmm. to go and work in Wolverhampton or Warsaw or something because we've identified a need somewhere but actually what we have got as the guild is places to spread out from so you might flip over into another thread or a project by meeting someone you might then spot another need so you may move from art to gardening over the years and I think that that's where that that interconnectedness is really valuable and strong and remains and grows in that community and recording that story I mean I think that's the really good what you Folk memory is, fades very fast, mm. doesn't it? Mm. And so people might be at stage four of that process and have no idea what stages mm. one, two, and three were unless somebody yeah. is actually plotting the journey. That's pretty important. I mean, an idea that, that uh, when we were discussing in the wider Ruskin community about what was going to happen in the bicentenary year that, that, that I suggested and that does exist on the Ruskin Today website was for 2019 to link together uh, on a map the various projects and uh, exhibitions that were going to be underway. As it happens, it's, it hasn't been necessary but in some ways because there's been such a flourishing of interest in Ruskin, mm. partly as a result of the Guild and this exhibition. But it, but it still interests me, the idea that one might touch in virtually, if you like, to a tiny mm. community project in one place and learn I'm afraid probably via your phone, but uh, you know, via some uh, other virtual means of something else similar that was happening next door or in the next community, yeah. or that had some link and that would allow some uh, 21st century sharing of experience that might in Ruskin's day not have been even possible. Um, I don't know whether that's a, that's a kind of digital project that requires a different set of craftspeople. Hi, Hedy. I'm visiting from New Zealand, uh, but I do live here sometimes. Um, I wonder if Ruskin could have imagined this third age statistic that we are dealing with. Yeah. And um, I'm well aware that worldwide the, the white, especially the white civilised person is, is, is the third age. We're very top heavy. And it is a bit of a problem because those people have largely been funnelled and have lost the capacity to find their soul and are uh, trapped by this, um, the mm. phenomenon of their, their wonderful, the wonderful path that they were on. I was struck, uh, Sarah, by your use of empath, empathy as a gateway mm. and how the, the word itself contains path and the widening of that uh, was, was very lovely. Thank you. I'll take that away with me today. But um, I, two of the things I volunteer doing in Wellington, New Zealand, is um, a tool library with a monthly repair cafe, and uh, Riso, which is a charity, the St. Vincent de Paul charity shops, have such an overload of fashion clothing that they can no longer dispose of it. And so they've opened up a workshop where you can go and learn to sew and repurpose all of the clothing that all of the fabric that they can't do anything with so they're educating people to sew and I think the most momentous thing for me was watching a girl from fashion school teach an older woman how to repair her own dress she'd forgotten the art because she'd been through the funnel system in the office and the girl from fashion school would have been 16 she taught this old yeah, woman. So At the end of the day, the whole room was in tears. Uh, out of that sprang so many. Um, the picture got wider very quickly once we realised that actually it's uh, this third age group that we might need to save so that they can save us back, if you see what I mean. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 it was my mother's funeral last week, and um, she was 99.9, .9, so 
two weeks' time, she would have been 100. Um, but that, those occasions give you great cause to kind of review. And um, I was remembering <laughs> that until I was 12, I think, she made all of my clothes, which was great until I was 11. <laughs> um, but actually she's kind of fourth age or was fourth age and actually even the third age has lost many of those, those mm. skills so we're kind of already it's, mm. it's slipping away it's, uh, there's no time like the presence for grabbing hold of it while it's still there as knowledge and my, the great grandfather who was the silversmith I knew quite well till I was seven or eight and uh, my memory of him was that he, at the age of 80, 82, was winning all the prizes in the gardening club in the Allotment Society in Sheffield. So I'm kind of like to think that somewhere in there, that machine line is there. I had no idea he was a silversmith. Why would I? But I loved the cacti in his greenhouse and the vegetables that he used to bring home. And that level of... Uh, so he was a kind of a Renaissance man of a very modest kind but managing to do those two extraordinarily different things within a day of really fine work and then digging his potatoes um, so uh, there is still I think enough of that folk memory if you like of, of how all of that works um, to be salvageable but you're we have to be quick. You're not tempted to take up silversmithing. <laughs> no, I'm not, actually. Maybe I should. <laughs> could be in the jeans. Yeah, it could. I did lots of scraper board as a, as a teenager, which was probably close <laughs> to the closeness of what he was doing. <laughs> that's, that's good. I don't know if you've got any more comments on the, the third age issue. Um, maybe not. I, I mean, I had a question for Chris just... On us just taking it in a slightly different direction, which was just I was struck when you were talking about how the Thames Estuary Partnership was now beginning to engage creatively with those who have the resources, as you put it, by which I took to mean big, big organisations, big business, and so on. Similar to something I was talking about in terms of business beginning to recognise, partly because it needs to attract a wider um, selection of recruits, that it needs to do something to recognise its. A supply, that how it supplies meaningful work, how it keeps people yeah. interested in work. And I, so I was partly wondering whether where, there is some moment here where the types of businesses and organisations that Ruskin attacked were perhaps just a fraction more open than they have been during the last 50 years to some of the things that the Guild and others are discussing. Uh, just, that just struck me as a potentially mm. fruitful way. Now, of course, the risk of capture, if you start to give, give over to um, business mm. or yeah. the risk that business decides that it wants to use mm. um, purposeful and meaningful things yeah. just as a cover is strong. But I'm inclined to say one shouldn't be entirely cynical. Possibly, uh, uh, this is my background as a business journalist, but not be entirely cynical about the prospect of that scale and power being used in a positive way. Just wonder what we thought about Well, I, I believe passionately in that, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, I think... Um, I can think of lots of examples, but the thing that I think people need to remember is that uh, even in the biggest, ugliest organisation in the world, the senior managers are probably grandparents... Um, they're, they're, all, they're all human of, beings probably members of the National Trust and the RSPB it's just that nobody's really made the relevance clear to them mm. of the real power and influence they have and uh, working with the National Grid has been really interesting because I'm lucky enough to work with people absolutely at the top of their game uh, in terms of engineering who have been initially forced to engage with people at the top of a completely different game. So we're just about to start undergrounding pylons across the Dorset Downs. And my first reaction when that site was selected was that this is going to give us nightmares with the archaeologists. You know, this is an area that's not really mm. been much studied, uh, but that we know is it's a, it's a known unknown, I think would be probably one way of describing <laughs> it. What's been fantastic over a period of four years of really determined 
collaboration and consultation and listening is that you move from a situation where everybody comes to the first meeting and sits there with their arms folded thinking, why the hell am I here? To after four years being over the table and we've, we've just, as a result of that consultation, um, the archaeologists persuaded, I think that's the right word, the National Grid, that they wanted a series of, of uh, exploratory trenches dug along the line they were going to be digging, the big trench thing. And they agreed to dig 150 of these things. But also that the archaeologists suddenly realised that the National Grid had access to things like LiDAR technology where they could map to right. two metres below ground level. What archaeologist has access to that kind of resource? And because they had a fantastic uh, kind of relationship after four years, we, they, National Grid dug 128 of the trenches. They found one arrowhead. And, you know, the engineers think, hallelujah. <laughs> Trench number 129, they found a third century Christian burial with lines of skeletons all facing east, all in stone. And the first reaction of the National Grid people was, oh my God. The first reaction of the archaeologists was, we really trust these people now. We have a relationship. This is the most exciting thing in my career as an archaeologist. And I know that they are as excited about this as I am. And I also know that they will have the capacity to divert their trench and that we will have the capacity and the resources to exhume these finds and, and study them as well. So it's, there is much more than just paying lip service to it. Mm -hmm. But what is so interesting is, is actually that the mutual respect that you build. And somebody was saying, well, I think it was you just a few minutes ago, was saying, well, are these the big guys with the lots of resources? We have to redefine resources, don't we? Yeah. The National Grid has no resources in terms of its knowledge of archaeology. In the same way that um, Thames Water, spending several billion pounds on the Thames Tideway Tunnel, has no resources in terms of understanding harbour do harbor, uh, porpoises, but London Zoo does. London Zoo has all, almost no financial resources, but has huge knowledge. And so, actually, there's a fantastic opportunity to, to play those communities of interest so that they all feel that they're learning and they all feel that they're being listened to and the whole becomes greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, and the tragedy is when you miss out a key player, the one that happens to have all the money mm. in, many of, in many situations, who actually may have the capacity to deliver in a way which none of the other players can. That's not to suggest that all of the robber barons are on the side of the good guys, but you, know, you can be selective about which ones you... I think this is a piece about not disqualifying yourself and saying, actually, we have got something to offer here and we can help, rather yeah. than presuming and, that they'll never... And being it. patient enough for people to discover that actually it's not that painful and that people are interested and I do know stuff that's useful and somebody's listening to me. That takes a little time. Yeah. Sarah, did you want... I'm going to ask us, I think, to, to begin to wrap up now, but I just wondered whether you wanted to have a, a last word or two. On uh, that or... Or whichever, you know, whatever you... Uh, I suppose, like thinking about that, it's about, it's about the pattern of what that relationship is, isn't it? Because we do tend to think... You know, there are, there are these big organisations and they've got money, but, but they'll, they might t take what we've got and turn it to their own end. And I, I think what you were saying about, you know, the resource that we have, I think it's been clear about that pattern. And, and if you do something like that, why would you do it? And what, what, do, you, what do you seek from it? Because I think sometimes, you know, it's another Donella Meadows quote, really, that, you know, to see the paradigm you're in well, you need to step outside of that paradigm and ideally not be in another paradigm, which is really difficult. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, to be able to step outside far enough to see the whole of what it is that you're dealing with rather than <clears throat> sort of starting a negotiation from or, it, within the paradigm that you're seeking to change, if that makes sense. And I, I think you need facilitators. You, you need brokers. And um, that, I think, is 
something that the Guild can do. It's what I'm lucky enough now to be asked to do in these kinds of situations. So, blessed are the peacemakers, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, <laughs> I've just come back from, from speaking in, in Israel, uh, in Tel Aviv, and uh, there was, I was in a session talking about the tidal estuary that flows out of Tel Aviv and how they needed to form better partnerships and work more collaboratively together. And I was thinking, this is, there's an elephant in this particular room, which is <laughs> pretty monstrous. But uh, <laughs> I think, the, I think also the, I mean, what links this is that we've all talked about, or this certainly alluded to, connections mm -hmm. and the amazing thing that. John Ruskin did before he, you know, obviously pre-internet, but as a sort of weaver of a web of different interests and spotting connections yeah. that people had not got the capacity, intellectual or other type of capacity to yeah. spot, joining dots as people who I write about, sort of strategy gurus like to talk about joining dots these days, and he was a great dot joiner. And I think actually some of the links that some businesses are now aware of yeah. the connections that they have to cultivate, mm -hmm. not least with communities, because mm. they recognise that the more deracinated they have become, mm. the less likely they are to be able to guard their licence to operate uh, when things go wrong. So even as a sort of self-interested action, um, being able to engage businesses that have a place literally on the, la on the ground, as National Grid does, uh, and remind them of that mm. and work with them is, you know, that does have a sort of Ruskinian feel to it because you're encouraging them to, point to see the connection between doing that and realising a wider objective. Yeah. I mean, I, I may be over-optimistic about it, but I think, it is, I think there is a way in which one can play up that network. Fantastic. I think let's finish on an optimistic note. That's a very good place uh, to be. Uh, thank you so much once again to our three speakers who've done us a grand job today. And I just joined with me. Thank you.